uh, networking and connectivity in Android. So obviously, as you realize, uh, within, within Android, oh, now I know it doesn't work. Within Android, uh, obviously, uh, Android is running on devices that are primarily acting as phones. That is the, uh, that's the main purpose of, of the device, smartphones. Of course, tablets are a different category altogether. They don't have the phone functionality. But uh, smartphones in general provide uh, many different ways of connecting to the outside world. Telephony is the primary reason for the smartphone. Obviously, you're using it as a phone. Of course, tablets are a different category, but even there, we have other forms of connectivity. Telephony and SMS typically goes with the telephony world. With all mobile phones, you can do telephony and SMS. Obviously, with an Android also, you need support for these. So those two are already available in Android. Now, the in, in, in important and interesting thing that we need to ask is, how can we access these functions from within the code? See, we are writing apps that uh, are running on the device. So you're writing apps in Java. But maybe within your app, you want to be able to trigger a telephone call, or maybe you want to be able to send and receive SMSs uh, from your application. In that case, you need access to the telephony connection, and you need access to the SMS connection. These two, of course, are provided through the telephony service. And uh, of course, besides these, you have the basic data access that is provided through Wi-Fi and uh, uh, UMTS, GPRS, 3G, 4G, LTE, whatever uh, other data connectivity that you have available. So these form the basic data transport mechanism. And then in addition to these, most mobile phones now come equipped with Bluetooth. Bluetooth providing short range connectivity and so on. So you can easily leverage Bluetooth to provide connectivity between devices to uh, provide certain functionality. Like for example, you want to play games with your friends across the table using your own mobile phones, you know, uh, multiplayer games. Maybe uh, you want to exchange a business card with each other. Maybe you want to connect your mobile phone to a, uh, a ear, ear, ear phone or uh, uh, headphones for uh, music and so on. Those kind of things are possible through the short range connectivity provided by Bluetooth. Let's look at each one of them and see how we can leverage this connectivity within our app. First, telephony. If you need to access the telephony part of the connectivity that your device provides, you make use of the manager called telephony manager. Okay? And obviously, Android has this uniform way of accessing all these different features using a get system service. You saw that we could use it to use it to access uh, location manager and other uh, services also. So you can use the system service method of accessing the telephone manager. So this gives you the handle or the reference to the telephone manager. After that, you can do a lot of information querying from the device, including things, for example, you can ask for the device ID, line number, network operator, and so on. Because maybe based upon the network operator but, uh, the, uh, or the device ID, you want to trigger certain things uh, to happen within your uh, device. Similarly, you can register a listener to receive notifications of telephony state changes. So for example, if you have an incoming phone call, maybe you are playing a game on the device and you have an incoming phone call, you need to pause the game immediately so that the user can attend to the phone call and then when they come back, you want to be able to resume the game from the point where the user, uh, um, where the game was paused. So for this, maybe you can, uh, you can put in a listener like this. So in this case, as soon as a call comes in and uh, at that point, the game can be paused, or say the app that you're using can be paused. When it is paused, for example, you may need to save some state so that you can restore it back uh, when the uh, user returns to that state and so on. So that is one reason why telephony services may be useful. 
or you can you could even allow from your app calling numbers for example to place a telephone call and so on uh, some of these things are automatically built in certain certain things can be triggered automatically because a android has this uh, functionality called linkify which we have used in one of our earlier lab exercises with that um, you know, uh, phone numbers and uh, URLs can become actionable items even without you including an implicit intent in there, uh, and so on. So th those are also possible. The second category is SMS. SMS may be a, a way that you can make use of, for example, for uh, sending messages, sending text messages for example you can automatically trigger your app to send text message to a particular uh, a particular uh, number um, when certain conditions are satisfied uh, for example if you recall uh, i had suggested one application um, idea earlier where we have the emergency alert button on the phone so one of the possible things that they may integrate into that app is that when the user presses the emergency alert button, an SMS can be sent immediately to maybe a police um, uh, you know, tracking, emergency tracking uh, services and so on, so that they are immediately notified of uh, what is going on. So this is one place that we can, uh, we can easily uh, make use. Another application where I saw the use of SMS is um, there is an application for calling taxi services that is available. Uh, there are many such, but one of them that we are familiar with, uh, when you when you call for a taxi from your location, your information is automatically sent by SMS to the uh, uh, taxi uh, operator, and then they'll be able to direct a taxi to your location immediately from there. So all these could be triggered from within your application by doing SMS, uh, uh, sending of SMS messages like this. Again, to get access to the SMS, you need to get one of the SMS manager. Uh, uh, and you need to add this permission into the manifest file before you can get, uh, you, you can allow your application to access the SMS features. Okay? Uh, so uh, you can easily create interesting applications. And similarly, for example, you can create an application that will auto-respond to SMS messages. So if, for example, somebody sends you an SMS message, you can automatically trigger the auto-respond so that you can tell them that, look, I'm busy right now. Um, I will read your SMS after I finish my work or something like that. Just like you have auto-replies in mails, you can have also have design an auto-responding um, uh, message uh, application. Now, in addition, connectivity, connectivity uh, encompasses all sorts of connectivity that is available, networking connectivity that is available, data networking in, in particular. This is all managed by this connectivity manager class. And to get a reference to the connectivity manager, again, my uh, network manager, connectivity manager, get system service, and then here you specify you want access to the connectivity service. And if you need to do that, you need to also add this to the manifest file. After that, you can make use of this within your application. So in this case, for example, you, once you have the connectivity, uh, uh, the reference to the uh, connectivity manager, then you can query it, for example, to get the network information. For example, within your application, if you don't want, if the user is currently uh, not connected to Wi-Fi, if you, in your application, if you don't want to make use of the internet, you can say if the connectivity is based upon uh, on uh, 3G or so on, don't allow the internet activity within my app. So you can save the user some, uh, you know, uh, uh, some un unnecessary uh, usage of data uh, data. Uh, allocation and uh, similarly you can say only if Wi-Fi is on then these functions will be restored those kind of things can be very easily done so for that you need to query the connectivity manager in order to understand which connections are currently active and which are not active and this can be easily done things like for example you can query saying get network info get active network info get all network info this way you'll be able to see what the connection state 
for each of them is. And you can also, within this object, you can use methods, things like, uh, for example, uh, uh, this uh, queries will return what is called as a network info object. And in this object, you can, you can execute methods like is available, is connected, or is connected or connecting, and so on. Get state, is this on or not? For example, how can you make use of this in practice? If you are using network access within your application, say your, your application depends upon internet connectivity, and the user has not turned on the internet connectivity, then you may not be able to deliver certain features. So in that case, when the user invokes a feature that requires internet access, you, can, you should always first check and make sure that internet access is available. So within your application, if you, if you depend upon internet access in order to provide certain services, this is the first check that you need to do. Is the device connected? If the device is not connected, maybe pop up a dialog box saying, your internet connectivity is not on at this moment. Please turn on your Wi-Fi or turn on your uh, uh, um, data and, and network access, mm -hmm. you, either 3G and so on. So that can be triggered after doing this check, for example. So a, a code like this included within your application can easily check to see whether connection is available or not. Okay. So if you're implementing any app that makes use of internet, always do this check. And based upon the condition, you warn the user about the fact that certain features may not be available if you're not connected. <coughs> and so on. Wi-Fi connectivity, in particular, is available through the Wi-Fi manager. And again, this is also accessed through this uh, call to get system service. And here you specify the parameter as Wi-Fi service and then you return the Wi-Fi manager. And if you're going to use Wi-Fi within your application, you need to include these permissions inside your app in the manifest file. So for example, if you want, if the Wi-Fi is not enabled and if you, if you want to automatically Turn on the uh, turn on the Wi-Fi. You can check things like this. Wi-Fi. This is reference to that Wi-Fi. Is Wi-Fi enabled? You uh, ask the question. If yes, if not, then get the Wi-Fi state, and then you set enabled true. That way, you can turn on Wi-Fi with, from within your app in case it is not available. So, and the Wi-Fi manager even allows you to, pro to scan hotspots, creating and managing Wi-Fi network connections. All these are provided by the, by the, by the Wi-Fi manager. So for example, you could, you could write an app that scans around to find what are all the Wi-Fi spots around that are available to you. It can make a list of all these things, the signal strengths coming from each other. If you write an app like that, that will be that will be making use of the Wi-Fi manager in order to obtain all the information and display the information for the user within the app. Another interesting connectivity that we make use of within, uh, uh, within uh, mobile devices, uh, smartphones in particular, is Bluetooth. How many of you are familiar with Bluetooth technology? Not familiar in the sense how, how many of you know how it operates? Not much. If you have taken a networking course, you might have been explained something uh, there. If not, let me give you a one-slide overview of Bluetooth. Again, Bluetooth in one slide. Basically, Bluetooth works around a master. In Bluetooth, there is always a master controller, master device. Uh, for example, if you are using Bluetooth on your PC, your PC acts as the master. If you're using Bluetooth on your mobile phone, your mobile phone acts as the master. All the other devices that connect to this master are all called as slaves. At any given point of time in Bluetooth, it can support up to eight different slaves. It can be connected to more than them, but only eight can be in active state. These other uh, devices that are connected can be in parked state. In parked state, they are not communicating using Bluetooth. So inactive devices 
we can support more, but active devices at a time, up to seven active slaves, and up to 255 inactive slaves can be supported by a single Bluetooth master. And it is the master that controls access to the connectivity. So the master determines if the devices can connect to it and, and communicate with it and so on. So the whole protocol, Bluetooth protocol is placed around the, uh, is uh, built around the master. That's the reason why when you turn on, uh, uh, you know, Bluetooth connectivity on your device and then you have other devices that you want to connect, it'll, the master, you need to give permission for the devices to connect and so on. You need to scan and be able to support those uh, and discover and uh, establish the connection in, uh, in, from, from the device. Now, Android itself has Bluetooth connectivity support built in, and you can make use of this Bluetooth connectivity support to do a lot of things. So support from the Bluetooth network stack is built in into Android uh, framework. The Bluetooth APIs that are part of the Android framework will allow to do things like, for example, scan for other Bluetooth devices. So a master can scan to see if there are any devices that are trying to connect to it. And slaves can scan to see if there are any masters around that you can connect to. And you can query the lo local Bluetooth adapter to find out which devices are currently paired. So for example, if you're running a music application and then you connect a Bluetooth headset to the music application, you can automatically, from your application, turn off the local speaker and then send the audio directly to the Bluetooth connection. And so, on. so those things can be automatically checked within your application. This can be done by querying the local Bluetooth adapter. You can open RFCOM channels, uh, radio frequency communication channels between two devices. So this is how you can pair two or more Bluetooth devices. If you need to play one-on-one -on -one game or multi-user games around the table and you want to use Bluetooth for supporting this, this can very easily be done uh, by using these features that are available within Bluetooth. And all this support comes from this particular Java package that is part of the Android framework, Android.Bluetooth package. I'll show you some code to, to, to illustrate how you can access some of these features from within your application. And furthermore, if you need access to the Bluetooth connectivity and want to use it within your application, you need to provide these two permissions within your manifest file. Okay? This one is necessary if you're going to manipulate any of the Bluetooth settings from your app. So you need to specify Bluetooth admin. If you just want to make use of the existing Bluetooth connectivity within an app without changing the existing settings, this is good enough. So depending on what you want to make use of it for, you, you should support one or two. Within the Android Bluetooth package itself, there are four different classes. What are the four classes? First one, the Bluetooth adapter class. This represents the local Bluetooth adapter. This is the class that you will query for obtaining information for example, discovering uh, devices, instantiating devices, and if you need to open and create a Bluetooth server socket on your device, you will make use of this. Why would you need to open a server socket? Say, for example, you have two mobile phones that are playing multi uh, multiplayer game. One of the devices has to act as the server, the other one will act as a client. The server, if you want to open it, you need to open a server socket on it so that other devices can connect to it. So, so if a master will always have to open a server socket in order to allow connectivity to the master. Bluetooth device class, this one represents the remote Bluetooth device. You want to send and uh, you know, contact the remote Bluetooth device, this one is returned through this particular the Bluetooth socket class, this represents the interface to the Bluetooth socket. This is the connection point through which you allow connections. If you have studied sockets in your networking course, 
you know how sockets work. This is the socket uh, support in Bluetooth that you are going to be using. And then Bluetooth server socket, which I mentioned earlier. This represents an open server socket, which you can allow to listen for incoming requests. You all have studied server sockets and client sockets and so on. How many of you have taken a clinical course before? Uh, I'm just the... You have taken? You have taken. Um, what about you guys? You haven't taken? Okay. Then uh, it, it's a bit hard, harder to understand. <laughs> but TCP, if you have taken a networking course, you would have been taught about server and client, and then you would have written some little programs, some little projects using client and server sockets. This is the Bluetooth version of those. It basically supports socket uh, access. And the Bluetooth cl a class, in general, describes the characteristics and capabilities of all the Bluetooth devices, and so on. Okay. On your device, if you want to turn on Bluetooth connectivity on your device, you should do this. Bluetooth adapter, M Bluetooth adapter dot get default adapter. If this is null, the device does not support Bluetooth. So this is how you can support, you can check and see whether your device has Bluetooth uh, hardware built in. If it is, If it doesn't exist, then there is not much you can do. But if your device supports Bluetooth, which Today, almost every phone supports Bluetooth. It's not a big deal anymore. In that case, for example, if you, uh, if you um, um, check the Bluetooth adapter and you see that it is not enabled, you can enable it by calling this particular function. You create an intent and then enable, you, you issue this Bluetooth uh, uh, enable intent to the Android framework. When this is done, on your screen, this kind of permission request will be popped up on the screen automatically by the Android framework. So it is essentially informing the user saying, this particular application wants Bluetooth connectivity. Are you willing to turn it on or not? So depending on whether the user clicks yes or no, you can proceed forward, assuming that the connectivity is turned on and turned off. If you need to find the Bluetooth devices, you need to discover devices that are surrounding your particular device. Device discovery is done through the Bluetooth adapter class. This Bluetooth adapter class supports uh, this method called start discovery. So in the Bluetooth adapter class, again, you get a reference to the Bluetooth adapter class and then invoke the start discovery method. This will return immediately. And when it returns immediately, this will indicate whether the discovery has been started successfully or not. So the, this call to this method basically starts the discovery process. The discovery process takes a few seconds to finish. So you don't want your application to get stuck. So that's why this will return immediately so that the execution can continue from that point out. It will immediately return specifying whether the connect, whether the scanning for devices has been started successfully or not. Now, the discovery process, as I said, it takes a while, so it can take a few seconds for it to finish. So, uh, uh, at that point, after the discovery process is completed, you will be notified about the fact that the discovery process is completed. If you want to be notified, then you have to register a broadcast receiver for this intent. Within your app, if you uh, want to know which devices are around, then you register a receiver. So that way, when the framework notifies you saying, I have finished the discovery process, this is the list of devices that are available to you, and these are the capabilities that you need to be able to receive by using broadcast receiver. As you realize, this will return immediately but it will not tell you what devices are available. It will simply return saying, I'm starting the scan. And then after the scanning is completed, you will be notified. And if you need to receive the notification, you start a broadcast receiver. OK? So this is a bit of code to, to, to explain to you how this whole process works. So. This is a simple 
broadcast receiver that I have created. So pri new broadcast receiver. And then inside there, when the discovery finds the device, if Bluetooth device action found equals action, get the Bluetooth device object. So this way you get access to the Bluetooth device. This is the class that allows you to query about the remote device that is connected to you. So that you can find out what the device uh, is capable of and so So that's how you can get access to the information about the device. Once you have created this Bluetooth uh, uh, broadcast receiver class, then you register the broadcast receiver. You all know how to register a receiver, right? We have seen the broadcast receiver example. This is the two steps you need to do in order to re register your broadcast receiver. So when the Android framework finishes the scanning, it will call you with, with the broadcast intent. It will send out the broadcast intent to you, and then you receive the intent and then respond. If you want your app device to be discoverable, then you create this one, and then you start the activity saying discover discoverable. Now, when you do this, Android uh, Android uh, framework will pop up this dialog box, essentially reminding the user saying an application is requesting permission to turn on Bluetooth and make your phone discoverable by other devices for a period of time. So this will allow other devices that are trying to connect to you to be able to discover you. So this. If you click yes, it will proceed. If not, it will not proceed. This has to be done if you are wanting to receive incoming connections from other devices. If you are the one that is initiating the connection, this is not needed because if you are the one that is starting the connection to other devices, then you know that you are automatically starting the connection, so you don't need to be discovered. So, if you need to query a device, you would say, say, uh, set Bluetooth adapter. And then if the devices are play there, you can uh, query information about these devices and then uh, put the information on the device and so on, on the framework and so on. Now, again, to remind you, if you are making use of Bluetooth uh, within your application, Obviously, you need to provide both the server side as well as the client side mechanisms within your application. The server side opens a listening socket so that the clients can connect to it. So the client side body must initiate the connection. So this is standard connectivity that you see even uh, at the TCP IP level. Uh, TCP uh, requires the client to start the connection. So the client side must initiate the connection to the server. And uh, uh, and uh, the, if the connection is established if both the server and client have a connected Bluetooth socket on the same channel. So this is again, if you are familiar with socket programming at the TCP level, this is very much similar to that. And uh, when the uh, client, uh, upon return, the client will receive the socket when it opens the RFCOM channel to the server. The server will receive a socket when an incoming connection is accepted. So this is a listening socket that you open on the server side. So when a client tries to connect to you, you are, you are informed. And when, when it is done, this notification will be popped up on the device side, saying somebody is trying to pair with you. Are you willing to uh, willing to allow the connection to, uh, to proceed or not? If they are not being paired previously, then this uh, connectivity request will be uh, okay. Now, so if you are implementing a Bluetooth uh, capable application, these are the things that you need to do on the client and server side. On the server side, you need to open a Bluetooth server socket. This is the listening socket that you open in order to allow other Bluetooth devices to connect to you. And you start listening for connection requests by calling accept, just like you say you do, do it for the TCP sockets. This is a blocking call. And so if you are doing accept, 
uh, you're, you're calling the accept method, make sure that you're not calling the accept method on the UI thread. Always create a separate thread and then do the accept call in there because the accept call is a blocking method. If it, if it gets blocked, then the UI will freeze, the UI thread will freeze, and then that will result in your, in your, uh, in your uh, device or Android frame will pop in, pop in, popping up the ANR request. Uh, um, um, you remember the ANR request, application not responding request that we talked about earlier? So that's what will happen. With, uh, with uh, Android 4.0 onwards, if you try to do any kind of networking on the UI thread, it will automatically disallow this application. I have been. I've managed to get out, get around doing that with earlier ones, but on uh, from Android 4.0 onwards, if you do any kind of connectivity on the UI thread, it will automatically quit. It will not allow you to do it. Uh, of course, this is a very natural thing. In the earlier and 2.3.3, 2.4, and earlier, they did not flow, They did not completely prevent it. But they asked you not to do it. They asked if you're opening any kind of connections, do it on a separate thread. But obviously, people tended to be lazy and continue to do it on the UI thread. So from 4.0 onwards, they don't allow you to do it at all. From the client side, using the Bluetooth device, you get a Bluetooth socket. You remember, this is the class on the client side that you can uh, you can access and then you initiate a connection to the server by calling the connect button. So this is how from the client side you establish a connection to the Bluetooth server. And then once the connection is established, then communication can take place. So you could write a simple file transfer application between two mobile devices using Bluetooth. Uh, I mean, such applications already exist, but in case you want to create one on your own, you can make use of it for providing this functionality. Okay. Here is a uh, uh, piece of code that explains to you how to make use of Bluetooth. Again, this has to be done inside a thread. So that's the important thing to remember. All these things, push it into a thread so that it is done in a background thread off from the main UI thread. The main UI thread will not get blocked because of any of these things. So what are you doing here? This thread, this is the server side. What On the server side, what do you do? You create a thread, and then inside this thread, you are calling public accept thread, and then you say uh, Bluetooth server socket and then you check my UUID, yeah. and then Bluetooth adapter, listen, listen using RFCOM with service record. This is how you open a listening socket. Okay. Now, in the run method of this thread, here, what you're doing is you're opening a socket and keep listening until an exception occurs and then you, uh, you uh, when, uh, uh, whenever this returns mm server socket accept, remember that this is a blocking call. So when you call this, this will return only when a client tries to establish a connection to you. And then if it returns, then you check for all these things. If the connection was accepted, then you continue and um, uh, do uh, further things. So on the server side, this is how you will handle the connection. Client side, it is done differently. Even on the client side, you create another background thread, and then all Bluetooth connectivity is pushed into the background thread. What are you doing here? Here, you are opening a. Um, see, no, notice that this device uh, here, uh, you uh, get the Bluetooth socket to connect to the device, and then. In the run method, you are trying to establish the connection here. So you say mm socket. What is this mm socket? 
MemSocket is the one that you created here. Device create socket to service record. Okay, so this is where you created the socket, and then that socket you are trying to do the connection through the socket. So from the client side, when you call the function, you are trying to establish the connection to the server side. If uh, if it is uh, unable to connect, then you close this socket. If it is connected, then you uh, call this method called manage connected socket, and then you proceed from that point. So from the client side, this is how you will open the connection to the server. Once the connection is established, you want to be able to open a byte channel to send and receive data through it. For this, you open an input stream and output stream. This is this is Java stuff. Get input stream, get output stream. This is Java stuff. How to read and write bytes from a channel or from a file. You all know how these things work in Java. Okay. So inside here, I have a, a piece of code that explains how you would make use of uh, uh, of these things. Let's see. So here, what are we doing here? Here, you're opening input stream and output stream. And then you say temp input stream socket, get input stream. This socket is the one that has been created earlier. Uh, and then output stream is get output stream to the same socket. And then after you do that, then you will be able to read and write bytes out of that stream. Right here, bytes mm stream read buffer mm stream obtain the message and so on. So this is how you will obtain messages from the client side and writing messages. Uh, uh, sorry, from from the socket and writing messages into the socket. All right, so that is how you will handle co communication through the Bluetooth socket. Again, if you're going to make use of Bluetooth, I would suggest you read more about it first to understand how to make use of it and then proceed from that point onwards. In addition to this, Android also has a built in support for making use of HTTP. You all know HTTP, right? HTTP is the protocol that is used for web and other traffic. But HTTP is a generic protocol. You can make use of HTTP for many things. So in Android, Android has an Apache and ha has many Apache HTTP components library built into the framework itself. HTTP client component. This enables handling of HTTP requests on your behalf. So for example, if you want to connect to a uh, web server and then pull data in from the web server, you can open an HTTP socket to the web server, and then you can pull in HTTP requests. On top of it, you can use things like SOAP and XML RPC, if you're familiar with SOAP and uh, other ones. And also, uh, you, can, you can use it for REST-style web services. If you if you're familiar with how to make use of web services, this can also be done directly using these. In addition, Android also includes parsers for XML and a parser for JSON. Are you all familiar with? Not your name. Uh, uh, are you familiar with XML and JSON? JSON? No. J JSON is a method of representing data. Um, XML is one format for representing data. JSON is another format. So uh, again, I don't want to go into details of how these work. These are straightforward things. Um, you should be able to easily pick up. And um, Android has built in W3C, DOM parser and SAX parser and the XML pull parser. In one of the uh, uh, lab exercises, we had made use of the XML pull parser to obtain XML from a server side. You remember the application was extended for doing these. JSON parser is available through the R.json um, cases in case you want to make use of any of these things. Certainly, you can do that. 
if you want to parse things like RSS, Atom, and other, other uh, feed parsers and so on, you can get hold of many third-party libraries that are available for specific formats. There are many libraries available that you can include into your application. Where they are available as jar files, and you can make use of them for doing uh, parsing. This, uh, the usage of these is pretty much similar to the way you would use it in standard job. Okay, so if you want to open a client, for example, you can open a client by saying HTTP client, new default HTTP client, and then you can generate a request saying HTTP get new HTTP request, and then you can set the URL for the request, and then and then send out the URL, and then receive the response. And then once you receive the response, you're getting back the, uh, the HTML coming in from the server side, and then you need to parse that, uh, that information coming in from the server side. Okay. Here is an example of how you would make use of HTTP uh, within your Android uh, device, within your, uh, within your application. Okay. You can uh, hear HTTP client, and then you can say HTTP host, and then you can use uh, uh, these things, and then paste uh, different post here, and then get the response from the from the uh, from the server side, and so so many different ways you can make use of network connectivity that is available 